We're now on to the supply chain panel, which is uh, near and dear to my heart because I think that uh, supply chains are probably one of the mis most misunderstood parts of the global economy that people don't even realize are misunderstood. And our first speaker here will be uh, Robert Johnson of Notre Dame. Um, Robert's research explores how the rise of global value change has altered trade and macroeconomic interdependence between countries. So he was the perfect person to help explain the gaps in what we know about supply chains. Robert, thank you very much for participating. Take it away. Thank you, uh, let me share. Oh, sorry. Okay, so uh, I'm happy to be here. I think our session will win this uh, award for uh, most recent ink spilled in the uh, <laughs> newspapers. Um, we are uh, gonna talk about measuring supply chains. So supply chains are everywhere uh, in the news right now. Um, the New York Times has dubbed the, the current moment the great uh, supply chain disruption. Um, and while current events are, are certainly a wake-up call, don't let the current media frenzy uh, fool you. It's not the first time uh, anyone has, has thought about uh, the fact that supply chains are important uh, for economic performance. So the reality is, there, there, I'm here to report some good news. The reality is there are many people in the research and policy community that have spent the last decade making huge strides uh, in supply chain analysis. For example, there have been large uh, advances in modeling, i.e. incorporating supply chains into macroeconomic and trade models used for policy analysis uh, and studying their role as a conduit for shocks. Simultaneously, there have been big advances uh, on the data front. In particular, there was a big advance uh, towards pushing or extending the input output architecture that underlies the national accounts across borders. Uh, many researchers, myself included, have worked to use trade data to link national input output tables across countries, which has allowed us to sort of trace out uh, global value chains. In addition, there's been a lot of progress very recently on innovative uses of new data sources like value added tax data and related sources to map out domestic uh, supply networks. And I'll talk more about uh, those issues later. Um, so although I'm here to report some progress, uh, I do, of course, want to emphasize not, not everything is well. Uh, there is a lot we don't know. And the main theme for the talk is going to be, I want to talk about uh, sort of huge gaps that exist uh, in U.S. data in particular uh, for measuring supply chains. I'll spend most of my time on that. And then I'll spend a few minutes uh, talking about some blind spots in the data uh, in terms of how we measure prices, thinking about uh, prices for material inputs and, and imports uh, in the data. That's actually ironically something that uh, our next panelist has worked quite a bit on. Um, so let me start uh, and just give you a, a sense of, of where the holes are uh, in, in existing data sources for kind of measuring uh, linkages of producers to global value chains. So we have very good data on cross-border shipments. And essentially what happens is we sort of lose track of goods both after they cross the border. So, so we regulate imports quite, quite extensively uh, and the government has a history of collecting very good data on imports because it has chosen to tax imports. Uh, and as a result, we have this customs data apparatus that tells us at a very detailed level uh, what's crossing the border but it's not telling us who is using uh, the inputs that cross the border. And so it's tracking those inputs behind the border that I think is the first order uh, issue in thinking about linkages to, to global supply chains. Um, there's a variety of different issues. One issue is some imported inputs end up not being imported directly by the firms that end up using them. They get fed through intermediaries in the data, for example, wholesalers in the data, and we sort of lose track of what happens to inputs after they go through those intermediaries. A second issue is that even if imports are directly imported by a, a firm that is gonna use them in production, imports then flow down the production chain to downstream users uh, in the production chain. So a stylized fact that we, we sort of know from the data of, of various types of data is that there are very few firms that import directly but many firms are indirectly exposed uh, to importing. So a concrete example would be, suppose you have imported rubber, we can see that at the border. For example, suppose we see a US tire producer importing that rubber, uh, 
well, then we don't know necessarily what the U.S. tire producer is doing. The tire producer presumably is selling its tires, say, to, to U.S. car manufacturers, and it's going to look in the data like U.S. car manufacturers aren't importing, but in fact, uh, you know, they're using that imported rubber that's been processed through the value chain. There's another aspect of the value chain that is hidden from us because we can't track imports properly. There's, there's sort of lateral exposure to import shocks that are hidden from our view. A good recent example is sort of the semiconductor uh, example. We, we import semiconductors and it turns out imported semiconductors are very important for US auto production. And, and shortages of semiconductors have led US auto producers to curtail production this year. That has had lateral impacts in the supply chain on all of the other suppliers to those US auto firms. So even though those firms don't look like their say US engine part uh, producing firms don't look like they're directly uh, exposed to trade shocks, they are indirectly exposed uh, through, through US auto producers. So those are one set of issues on the import side. On the export side, we have similar problems in the sense that we see the goods that are being exported as they exit the, the US border, but we have no, virtually no idea how those things are actually being produced in the US. Uh, and again, the problem is essentially the same. Very few firms are directly engaged in exporting. In most firms, their output ends up being exported only indirectly because it's embodied uh, in downstream production. For example, suppose you have a US engine part producer. If their engine parts are embodied in, in US produced cars and those cars are exported, it'll look to us in the data like the engine parts producer is not exporting, but in fact, the content that it's producing is ultimately uh, sold into international markets. And so there's a very strong sense in, in, and it's something that I've reflected on over and over uh, as we think about this data, mapping the domestic production network seems to be critical and it's a big missing piece for understanding exposures to international shocks. Everyone, when they think about value chains and global value chain shocks, they wanna talk about you know, linkages abroad, but it's really the domestic linkages and how international shocks feed through the domestic linkages that I think is the first order uh, problem in the way that we think about the problem and the way that we uh, are collecting data. So a second issue that's come up more recently uh, is thinking about sort of questions about bottlenecks in the production network and notions of, of critical inputs in production. So recent attention is focused on supply chain constraints and those constraints as being binding constraints on uh, production and also driving inflation and, and things of that nature. Um, the, the thing I wanna emphasize here is while we sort of have some general sense of how that's gonna work, the real problem going forward for policy is going to be how to sort of nail the details of exactly where are the bottlenecks and exactly where are the critical inputs. And it's nailing those details that's critically important. So for example, take a recent uh, set of episodes. Suppose there's disruptions at US ports, you know, just hypothetically. <laughs> uh, suppose that we can't get goods through the port of LA. To think about the implications of that for the economy, you need to know sort of what goods are coming into the port. Again, we have pretty good data at the border about where stuff is coming into the country and what is coming into the country. The problem then lies after we clear the border. So where are those goods being shipped after they clear customs? We have very limited data on international trade that tracks shipments across uh, areas of the country. There's a question about if goods come through the port, what industries are they going to? Uh, you would think that would be quite natural, but, but you know, the, the, if a particular input comes through the port of LA, it might end up going to different industries than if that uh, input is cycled through a port uh, in South Carolina. What firms within each industry are using the imports? So it, firms are very heterogeneous within industries and how intensively they directly and indirectly use imports. And we have very little information on that uh, in the US. Um, it's also important from an economic sense to think about how important those individual inputs that are being disrupted are to the firm. That's very hard to quantify and it actually requires sort of economic concepts outside of the data and measurement uh, perspective. The, the value of the inputs being imported is not necessarily a good indicator of how important uh, those inputs are to the firm. What we've learned is sometimes very low value stuff can turn out to be a bottleneck in the production. For example, glass vials ended up being a huge bottleneck in the production of vaccines. The last thing 
you know, related to what I just said is, you know, even if we figure out how important the inputs are to a particular firm, then the firm is linked to other firms through the input output network. So the bottom line I want to leave you with here is there's going to be a lot of emphasis going forward on thinking about questions of supply chain resilience and sort of constructing those policies is, is very difficult in the abstract. We're going to need to have much better uh, data collection uh, to design policies that really do promote resilience. There's a lot we don't know about what it means to, to be resilient versus not in the supply chain context. Um, so let me say two words about data infrastructure. So the gold standard now in the measuring production networks area is essentially to use value-added tax data. Um, so what value-added tax data does in many countries in order to enforce the value-added tax, essentially all firm-to-firm -firm sales are reported to the government. Sometimes the governments are collecting literally the invoices underlying all those sales, which also have values, quantities, product names, et cetera. And so they have incredibly detailed information on, on value chain linkages domestically. And this data is becoming available in many countries around the world. Belgium was a leader in this, but Chile's uh, on the frontier as well. And, and there's a variety of other sources that people are working with too. The big data infrastructure problem I see in the US is, is we, we don't have anything that is similar to this notion of a VAT system. Essentially what we get from the US data infrastructure are fragmented snapshots of individual components of the supply chain. And it's really hard at the moment to put the big picture together, to put those data sources together, to form a complete picture of what's going on in the US production network. Um, and so I think the, the main areas that, you know, one needs to focus on are kind of working off of what's already here. So I can imagine efforts to enhance uh, the economic census, for example, to supplement or improve the materials and production supplements to kind of solicit more information about supply chain linkages across firms. I think there's good investments that could be made in making customs data and detailed uh, customs data more publicly accessible. The commodity flow survey is a very useful tool for tracking domestic trade, but it's not designed to track supply chain linkages. Frankly, it's not even designed to track domestic trade. It's designed for purposes of developing transportation policy. I think re-envisioning what we're doing in surveying domestic uh, trade would be very useful. And lastly, there's been some good progress in various places in the literature using financial reporting as a way of measuring supply chain linkages. So for example, Currently, publicly listed firms are required to disclose uh, their major customers in the US, anyone they sell more than 10% of their revenue to, which is perhaps a bit of a high threshold. And the question is, is there a way to build into the financial reporting more scope for emphasis on reporting of supply chain vulnerabilities for firms to sort of report where they think their own vulnerabilities lie? And then in addition, I'm interested in asking the question, can we extend to the reporting standards that apply to publicly listed firms to potentially non-listed firms? It seems like uh, that's something that, that could work because many firms are already doing that. I'll just make one final point quickly. Um, this is uh, actually a segue into Susan. I don't know whether she's gonna end up talking about any of this, but there are also well-known biases in many, many of the price indexes related to input use uh, that we use in the US to construct uh, various elements of the national accounts. So for example, we know essentially that the BLS import price indexes don't capture cost savings from substitution across countries. We know that standard deflators being used to deflate input use uh, at the firm level are not capturing cost savings due to substitutions of domestic for foreign suppliers. And then there are higher order concerns in terms of you know, growth in varieties of inputs over time, quality adjustment of the inputs being used over time that are not being uh, currently in, embedded in these indexes. And altogether, this creates huge measurement biases, potentially huge measurement biases and thinking about measuring value added, productivity and other important uh, uh, aspects of the production process. Um, and so, and so I think that's another area that, that a, a big push should be made. We sort of know what the sourcing substitution biases are, but very little has actually been done uh, as far as I know to address them. I think again, related to fragmented data infrastructure, there may be ways to use other data sources, for example, customs data to, to improve the type of price measurement that's going on. Um, that's, I know there's experimental work uh, underway uh, in that direction, but I think more could be done. Um, 
in particular, I think more could be done in thinking about how to use the, the customs data to impute sort of the gains from variety growth and, and quality adjusted price changes um, uh, to better measure uh, import prices and the impact of, of imported inputs on US producers. Um, so I leave you with a bit of a joke. I come to you from one of the great Catholic universities in America to tell you Christmas is not canceled despite the supply chain woes. Um, but it is important, I think, that we use this crisis and all the attention directed at supply chains at the moment to, uh, to redirect our, our efforts at the data levels to, to collect better information on supply chains going forward. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robert, for that, for that presentation. Um, I, I have a question to you about the concept of resiliency. Sure. Okay. Um, do we have the information? I mean, the question, when you sort of read the, I read the President Biden's 100-day review of supply chains. Yep. And one of the things that came across from that was they really didn't think they had enough information, enough data to actually assess the resilience, key, key resiliency characteristics of semiconductors, pharmaceuticals, and so forth. I mean, if we were, if we're trying to sort of, because resiliency is a systems property, it's not a property of individual supply chains. Well, I think there's two issues. So I think it is true for individual producers. I mean, you know, there's different levels of this problem. For an individual producer, assessing resiliency is really, it's, it's not something you can directly measure. It's, it's sort of an economic concept where if I think about, if I have a shock to a particular input, how important is that shock in determining whether I can produce my goods? So that's a technological question for the firm. And better data is gonna be fundamentally important to allow people to start to evaluate sort of what is technologically necessary or where are the critical inputs coming from in the production process. Um, but more broadly, I, I, what you raised in terms of the systems issue is then secondarily important. If I think about you know, uh, seat belts, uh, a seatbelt fastener, meaning that GM can't produce a car, that's a very low value input to GM, but it may shut down GM's production. And then the, the effects of that ripple through the input output system or, or through production networks in a way that's very not obvious because we don't know who all of GM's other suppliers are. We don't know where GM may be supplying to downstream. So I, I think there is a sense in which the connectivity of producers matters, but there's also a sense in which, you know, there are a lot of open questions about what it means to have a resilient production process and what it means to be a critical input in the production process uh, that I think need to be answered through through better use of, of, of data and more data being collected. So, so you say connectivity, do we need a different data architecture for how we think about I mean, you say we don't have the we don't have the VAT, so we have to substitute something else. I mean, do we is there something that we need to sort of if if you were in charge, what would be the first thing you would do? I know you sort of listed. That may be I knew easier. you were going to ask that question. You've been asking everybody that question. So yes. I was thinking about where would I throw money and what would I do if I were in charge? So if I were the supply chain czar, I would attempt to uh, make the existing data sources work better together than they currently do. So for example, as I said, you know, we, we have this thing called the Commodity Flow Survey, which is sort of tracking international trade. But if I want to sort of track in any reasonable sense how goods are moving from the port of LA to what jurisdictions or what regions of the country those things are moving to, I have very, very little information on that. So, so thinking about those questions, how can I make the commodity flow survey work more closely with customs data would be very useful. Um, thinking about how I can make the customs data sources talk more cleanly with the things that the BEA uh, is using to construct, say, input use tables in the national accounts. Those sorts of questions uh, are, are very important too. So, you know, it's hard to envision a radical revamping of the data infrastructure, but I think there are a lot of ways in which marginal improvements could make the data talk together better to, in a way that we could we could really improve our understanding quite a bit. So, so I'm kind of into the supply chain for the supply chain data. You know, okay, we optimize I, I, that supply chain. So, is that it's uh, so we, before we move on to, to to Sue, is there is there and besides talking about can, Christmas not being canceled, which I'm glad to hear. Okay, <laughs> is there any sort of last word that you'd sort of like to, if your policymakers or staffers listening, okay, is there any last word you'd like to sort of tell them about tracking supply chains? Um, I think I'll echo what you said at the beginning, which is 
you know, I think this has been one of the most underinvested areas in the national accounts infrastructure. Uh, the fact that we can't even at the, in the input output architecture construct an input use table at the sectoral level that relies on sort of primary data sources and not imputation is, is really problematic, I think, for thinking about input linkages and the role of international shocks in the US economy. And I, I think we need to remedy this situation because supply chains aren't going away. <laughs> the global economy is here That's to right. stay and, and we need that investment. Terrific. Thank you very much for your time today. This was terrific. Thank you. Now we turn to uh, to Sue uh, to Sue Hausman. Okay, uh, I, I, Sue. I looked back at the conference that we put together a few years ago, and here was the here was the title of it: "Measuring Globalization: Better Trace Statistics for Better Policy." Okay, I didn't realize that what I that the title that I picked for that one was echoing the uh, the past conference. Um, Sue Hausman is Vice President and Director of Research at the Upjohn Institute for Employment Research. Her recent research focuses on temporary and contract employment arrangements, domestic outsourcing, offshoring, manufacturing, and measurement issues, and economic statistics, which sounds which makes you the perfect person to be on this conference. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Mike. And I want to start by uh, thanking Robert for the advertisement for my work, and also I'd like to point people to uh, Mike Mandel's uh, path baking work on on uh, price and <laughs> he was the one Maybe who I originally don't... pointed out this problem to me. So. That's 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 a long time ago, Sue. Okay. Uh... Good. So at this point, I hope that you see my screen. Yes. Um, so I actually, uh, in an effort to not overlap too much with uh, Robert's excellent remarks, I'm going to focus uh, really on workforce policy issues and their connection to uh, 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 better uh, data on supply chains, how we can think about this. And I guess broadly conceptually, I want to think about supply chains, whether they be domestic or the global as embedding a lot of labor content. So they're kind of flows of, let's think of these as flows of, flows of labor across borders or across uh, areas that, uh, uh, companies. Um, the issues that, uh, uh, the policy issues are, are really differ whether we're talking about domestic versus international, though the phenomenon of uh, supply chains becoming much more complex are basically the same uh, phenomenon. Let's start off with uh, domestic supply chains and networks. On the left, you'll see just a traditional linear supply chain. This is, uh, you know, kind of the farm to table supply chain uh, from farms to food processing, warehouse and distribution to places that sell food. But supply chains have become more complex. This is uh, in part related to the decline of vertically integrated firms and the focus on quote, core competencies that uh, really took place in a big way in the late uh, latter part of the 20th century and the development of new business models with uh, elaborate contracting arrangements at, uh, and supply chains and networks. And all of this develop, all these developments were facilitated by improvements in communications and other technologies. So here, I'm just gonna quickly depict a supply chain with many contractual patterns. So uh, the example is a hotel company, but the whole hotel in the hotel industry, by and large, uh, large companies like Hilton or Marriott and the like don't run their own franchises. Um, so the, if you go to stay in a hotel, uh, you're likely staying in a uh, hotel that's owned by an independent business. The larger company um, uh, controls much of what goes on, but it does not employ the low wage workers that by and large work in the hotels. The hotel in turn will outsource many uh, uh, ancillary services is likely to such as landscaping, security, industrial laundry, even the person at the front desk may be supplied by a staffing company. And the, uh, uh, the hotel buys, uh, you know, linens, furniture and the like uh, in this day and age, uh, uh, probably almost undoubtedly produced overseas, but that will come and land in a warehouse first in the US. Um, unless we're talking about Amazon, which is the exception, uh, warehouses make use of uh, extensive use of temporary staffing companies. So many of the workers will not actually be employees of the company owning the warehouse. When that uh, uh, goes out for, for uh, to be shipped, 
uh, to the hotel and other customers, uh, the trunking company uh, uh, may very well employ workers as independent contractors. So that just gives you an example of some of the contractual patterns in what we might call, think of a supply chain or supply network. So what are the implications for workers and the policy concerns? Well, one thing that we, uh, a stylized uh, fact that's been established recently is that workers are increasingly are being sorted into firms by skill levels. Low wage workers increasingly are being uh, working with other low wage workers and high wage workers with high wage workers in firms. Some evidence connects this to outsourcing and to the growth in earnings inequality. Um, the outsourcing of low wage workers has also been linked to increased wage and hours uh, violations and unsafe safe workplaces in some instances. Workers, um, as I've already noted, often are hired as independent contractors. What does that mean? Why is that important? Well, for one, they're not covered by employment and labor laws. They're not covered by unemployment insurance compensation or nor are they eligible for uh, employer provided benefits. They're completely outside the social safety net or a system of social protections that we were developed um, uh, by many of them starting in the De Great Depression to help uh, uh, protect workers. They're outside that system. Although there are many good reasons for companies to outsource to develop these uh, complicated contractual arrangements, lowering, lowering liability for workers is sometimes motivation for that. So this has given rise to a number of policy debates. Let me mention a, a couple. Uh, one is what should be the joint employer responsibility for employers, specifically in the context of contracting or other business models like franchising? What responsibility do client firms have for the, uh, their contract workers or workers in other parts of the supply chain? What responsibility do franchisors have for workers and franchisees? For example, does a business, a, a, a movie theater that hires uh, workers for cleaning or does McDonald's uh, you know, uh, have responsibility if the contract cleaning uh, company uh, doesn't pay its workers, it engages in wage theft? Um, those are, are, are debates uh, and uh, uh, sources of potential policy change uh, that were very important uh, uh, part of the agenda in the Obama administration. Uh, there was a tightening, efforts to tighten uh, uh, regulations around joint employer res uh, uh, legal responsibilities in these kinds of contracting cases or, or franchisors, uh, or discussion at least in the case of franchise businesses. Um, and what was passed was largely undone by the Trump administration. But it's, it's an ongoing debate. Another debate is, should we uh, be extending uh, the social safety net to independent contractors? Uh, should we be developing new policies to facilitate their access to health insurance benefits or retirement plans? Um, and should unemployment insurance and workers' compensation be extended to independent contractors? Um, some of you may remember that during the pandemic, at the peak, uh, of the pandemic with the payments of uh, pandemic unemployment assistance, the PUA benefits that were designed to go to independent contractors and others who might not uh, qualify for, for normal uh, UI benefits, uh, a staggering uh, up to 40% of the workers receiving UI benefits at, at some points in time during, uh, during that period uh, were receiving uh, these, these kinds of benefits, suggesting that it was a larger problem. So um, whether we take steps to tighten joint employer responsibility or, or extend social safety nets and the like uh, really depends to a large degree on how large these phenomena are. Um, the first thing a, a, a legislator or other policymaker asks me and others uh, in thinking about these things is, well, what's been the growth in outsourcing? Where is it occurring? What are its implications for workers and how big? is the independent contractor or gig workforce. We don't have very good answers for, to those questions. Um, we don't because of uh, data gaps. So let me uh, now spend a little bit of time on uh, uh, how we might improve data to inform these debates. 
So we need better information on supply chains. Robert went into uh, uh, quite a lot of detail on this, so I won't repeat what he said. But uh, you know, we need information on who purchases what. Um, census, as he's noted, uh, you know, continues to make improvements in this area. They've, uh, uh, out, but outside of materials purchases by manufacturers, it's often lim limited. Um, I'm going to really emphasize uh, uh, the need for more detailed data on uh, purchases of services from other businesses and the use of independent contractors. You know, uh, uh, querying that in, in some of the business surveys that we conduct. Um, Ideally, data should distinguish between domestic and foreign suppliers. Uh, we don't do that in the United States. That was a point uh, Robert made. Such data is really necessary to study the implications of outsourcing for workers to answer questions like, uh, to what degree has it contributed to earnings inequality in the US? Um, is even tightening joint employer status warranted? We have a lot of case study evidence of that, but not systematic evidence. It requires uh, more systematic data on supply chains, basically. So we also, I mentioned collecting some uh, data. It's, it is in the tax data, but not in survey data so, so far, except for some experimental surveys. But we need better data on self-employment in the US, especially independent contractors and workers in what we might think of as informal or non-employee arrangements. Um, the main source of data on uh, self-employment comes from our uh, flagship household surveys, the current population survey, the American community uh, survey, but a growing body of evidence, including some by our next speaker, John Holtwanger and uh, co-authors, suggests that uh, there has been a substantial understatement of self-employment, partly because many independent contractors appear to be coded. Uh, uh, as uh, appear to be coded as employees. Um, this occurs in part because if responded to a household survey reports that they work for an organization, it's assumed that they are W-2 employees. That's kind of a quaint idea. Um, unless you're a traditional business owner, they may not think of themselves as self-employed. So evidence, uh, as I mentioned, from tax data, but also uh, from some uh, testing that I did with uh, my colleagues, Catherine Abraham and Brad Hirschbein is really pointing to this as a problem. We need to revise survey questions to probe about the nature of uh, the employment arrangement. Uh, recent National Academy of Sciences uh, consensus panel, which I chaired, um, made such recommendations uh, for improving questions on the contingent worker supplement to the current population survey. Okay. In closing, let me just say a, a few words about global supply chains. So supply chains, of course, uh, extend across borders and the rapid growth of international trade reflects the development of uh, complex uh, global supply chains. Um, as is pointed out, goods may cross international borders many times, and the growth in international trade includes very rapid growth in services trade. So we see with this a much wider range of occupations subject to global competition in recent years. Um, some of us who have been studying this for a while recall, may recall a decade roughly a decade or so ago, there was a lot of attention paid to services offshoring and what, uh, what uh, occupations were becoming more vulnerable. That uh, very little has been written on that recently. I think it's in part because of lack of data. So what are the workforce policy issues involved? Uh, for one, what is the competitiveness of the American workforce in both high and low skilled occupations? Uh, historically, we've often thought, well, it's the production workers who are most vulnerable, but it's also, um, you know, it, it is uh, a much broader range of occupations. It includes our engineers and uh, other people in IT and R&D. And then how is globalization affecting future demand for workers by occupation and skill level? We need this kind of information for developing uh, sensible education and workforce policies. So to conclude, um, you know, what kind of uh, data caps exist and, the, and potential improvements that could be made? Um, in terms of measuring the competitiveness of workers, 
There's a need for comparisons of wage and benefit levels and productivity uh, in countries. Uh, Robert mentioned the, uh, uh, some price index problems. I'm not uh, in the interest of time going to go into this, but this whole comparison of wages is uh, kind of in a simple way touches on this. Um, uh, recently, uh, over the Thanksgiving holiday, in fact, an, an analyst for one of the big investment houses uh, threw out that, uh, you know, uh, that, that uh, engineers in India and generic uh, 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 drug production uh, could be uh, cost uh, of just a mere fraction of the cost of hiring uh, someone in the United States. Um, that's the kind of information that we really want to know about, and, and that was a, a large a, a part of why we didn't see generic uh, drug manufacturing in the U.S. anymore. But that's the kind of thing that we want to understand. Historically, we've only looked at uh, labor, uh, or, sorry, manufacturing workers, in particular production workers, um, but we want to think about this more broadly. A decade roughly ago, um, uh, the International Labor Comparisons Program at the Bureau of Labor Statistics was ended, it was cut uh, as part of a, uh, a belt tightening exercise. This gets back to a point that many people have uh, made, uh, preceding speakers have made, uh, which is the under-resourced uh, uh, statistical agencies. Um, so uh, anyway, that was cut. Some of their uh, jobs, tasks were picked up by the conference board and some of this is being done by uh, OECD. But I think there's, there's probably room here to reinstate the International Labor Comparisons Program at ELS uh, to study uh, uh, perhaps special sectors and to fill in some of the gaps that are needed for policies. Um, and finally, um, we need to assess the implications for future demand uh, and occupations uh, uh, for occupations and skills. Robert touched on the need to fill in uh, the flows of goods and services across borders. Uh, he's done a lot of work on building what are sometimes called world input output tables. There have been recent efforts to improve measures, but many gaps remain, especially in the services area, uh, which is an, an are really important flows of, of workers, effectively flows of workers across borders. And then my final suggestion is, is that um, we should be thinking about linking occupational data to, uh, by industry to trade data uh, to model the impacts. Despite these uh, data gaps uh, that exist, use the data that we have so far to, to model what the, to better understand uh, the uh, labor skills embedded in import and export flows and to understand the impacts of trade on uh, American workers. So I will close with that. Thank you so much, Sue. That was terrific. We do have a question from the audience uh, from Andrew Reamer, who you know, and he asks, what's the potential contribution of the new investigation announcement this week by the US ITC on the distributional effects of US trade, trade and trade policy on US workers? Sorry, so what is the potential effects of that? What's the potential contribution in terms of data from this new investigation? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, what the point that, that I was making is we don't quite have all the data that we need to under, to really answer those questions and there's going to be more development, but certainly one could take a, a first pass at that. I think that's a I think that's a really important question. That one thing that, that an investigation like that can do is actually point out where the data gaps are, rather exactly. than pretending rather than pretending they don't exist. Exactly. Let me just let me I mean let me just address one thing that you that you raised about the the sorting of um, of uh, workers and by skill levels. One of the things that is interesting to me when I look back at a company like Kodak is that you had uh, production workers in the same organization as research workers and kind of pulled up the wages of the production workers. Um, and I think this is a very fruitful area of research at this point. And one of the things, one of the weird data sets that, that I look at is companies are now required to report the, the salary, the earnings of their median workers and on their financial reports. And one thing which is striking is different companies in the same industry have very different medians 
suggesting that they have very different strategies for the way that they uh, assemble their workforces. Have you thought about this at all? Oh, yes, very definitely. I think it affects lots of things, including um, uh, including our productivity measures, by the way, because uh, the, the, the big question here uh, is, uh, you know, are these, do these differences reflect uh, different patterns of outsourcing um, or other business models, or if they hived off their low wage workers? There is some research evidence to suggest that this kind of hiving has pushed down wages when you when you concentrate workers into lower wage firms, it uh, it uh, it's a becomes a mechanism for uh, over time lowering wages. Um, but also, we 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 just don't know. We don't know the degree. So we have a stylized fact that uh, much of the productivity growth is is being driven by these high wage superstar firms. And is that because they are so much more innovative? Or to what degree could other factors such as different business models be contributing to that? We don't know because we don't have good data on, uh, on these kinds of supply chains. That's, these are both, these are really important points. And, and, I, and I know that I think about this, you know, I think I, I've written a lot about uh, wages in the e-commerce e industry, which where the, where you have, I think either you or, or Robert mentioned this, you know, Amazon has followed the strategy of having its product, its e-commerce e fulfillment workers in the same benefit structure as the whole company, okay? And it produces a diff very different sort of flavor than if you separate them out. Yes, exactly. And just to, to close on Amazon, uh, that's that's a really interesting point that I recently had a a, 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 a hosted a, a uh, mini mini convening on that that discussed precisely that issue. Um, but you'll also note uh, Amazon is the exception rather than the rule in terms of hiring its own uh, warehouse workers. But um, you'll notice that Amazon uh, has also uh, outsourced its uh, drivers. So uh, to they are by and large independent contractors. So the person who delivers your an Amazon package in all likelihood is an independent contractor, not an employee of Amazon. Well, this is this is all very interesting stuff. And I really thank you for your, uh, for your presentation here. Uh, okay, um, now we'll uh, we now we'll turn to the um, to the final presenter, uh, John Holtewanger, and uh, who will uh, end the conference with some thoughts about real time statistics. Uh, John, I, I am so glad to have John as part of this. He's a distinguished university professor in the Department of Economics at the University of Maryland. He served as chief economist in the U.S. Census Bureau. He is research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research, a senior research fellow at the Center for Economic Studies at, at the Census Bureau, a fellow of the Society of Labor Economics and the Econometric Society. And perhaps most important, he's played a major role in developing and studying US longitudinal firm level data. And that the statistical and measurement methods he has helped to develop to measure and study firm dynamics are increasingly used by statistical agencies around the world. So uh, he's gonna talk about a real time measurement, which is incredibly important. And, uh, and go ahead, John. Okay, great. So this has been, uh, thanks for Michael for putting all this together. And uh, I very much have enjoyed everybody else's remarks. And so, and, and I'll try to be brief. We're trying to make sure we get out of here on a timely basis. In, in many ways, as I listened to the previous remarks that you know, we've seen a fantastic review of, of quite uh, disparate, but, but, but real data gaps. And I'm very sympathetic with, with all those data gaps. In, in, in my brief remarks, um, uh, I actually want to argue. I didn't get that. Uh, Did you try again? I, I want to argue that that, that that in many ways we, we need not only to fill these data gaps, but but particularly for high frequency statistics in the United States. By that I mean the monthly and the quarterly statistics that we very much rely on for policy making, uh, both both by uh, institutions like the Federal Reserve or for fiscal policy or you know, or uh, local governments and so on. That we basically need to, to we need a new architecture. And I think, I think actually the agencies themselves increasingly recognize this. And I wanna talk a little bit about why we need this. And then I, I wanna argue that it's actually in the feasible set to, to do this now. Um, and, and, and particularly as the title of my talk is with real-time transactions data. So, so what's, what's, the, what's sort of the, the core issue 
you know, if we think about the way the national accounts are put together, and, and I, I mean, kind of all the statistics from the national accounts, the methods were, were largely developed in the mid 20th century. And it, it's a very survey centric approach. I mean, it was a, it's a remarkable system, you could say, and, and, the, and the agencies do a fantastic job. But, but both partly for historical reasons, but, but partly for other kinds of reasons, it turns out the US is somewhat idiosyncratic for advanced economies to have quite a, a siloed or balkanized approach. And let me just go over this briefly. So, and particularly I'm gonna, I'm gonna use as my primary example, uh, 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 real output growth, inflation and productivity. But those are, those are obviously really cr critical uh, a a estimates. So essentially what we do is we have one agency co collect the numerator of GDP, that is the nominal revenue, and that's the Census Bureau through a variety of surveys primarily, at, particularly at high frequencies. And then we have another agency uh, collect the denominator of GDP, basically through the CPI and PPI programs. Um, and then we have a, a third agency do the division, uh, the Bureau of Economic Analysis. And I've over, oversimplified or not, this is not intended to be at all a criticism of the agencies. I think they're actually do, I'll say, a, a, a remarkable job. But um, there's all kinds of issues associated with this balkanized approach. One of them, which, which lots of the folks on this, in this program have, have talked about in the past is BLS's uh, business frame is completely different from census's business frame, which means the BEA's reconciliation it, 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 it is very difficult. The, the second thing that, that's very much happening, particularly as we've moved into the 21st century, is it's, it's not just that, you, that there, there's a possibility of, of re-engineering the architecture, but, but there's a real a, a push factor too. And what's the push factor? Not only is the existing uh, approach survey centric, but response rates, particularly to the high frequency household and business surveys, I have been dropping and dropping and dropping. And so the agencies are trying to find ways, particularly for the high frequencies, to, uh, to be able to, to get the data in a different kind of way. They're already working on this. Now, you know, for, for, for key parts of this, particularly for um, the, both the revenue numbers, but also the price numbers, the, the survey approach implies that uh, in, in many ways, the statistics that we see are largely based upon continuing businesses. So we're often we're often missing uh, the, the the role of, of business turnover. That's particularly important in times like the like the pandemic, for example. We're also missing, and this has come up already today, uh, given the way the CPI is is and PPI put together, the weights are updated infrequently, and we're using this this Lespers approach. Which, which, which sort of you know, basically uses base period weights rather than idealized um, sort of an average of, of uh, in, in superlative indices, um, uh, current and, 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 and lag weights. So, so in, in, I'll say, in, in, I'm gonna give you some examples. Of, we, we miss some things, we miss important things because of this approach. Now, what, what's the idea that lots of us are, are trying to explore is we, we increasingly recognize, we've kind of recognized this for the last couple of decades, but I think it's, we now recognize we could, we could actually do this now, is there's literally a fire hose of transactions level data, particularly for the retail trade sector, but for other sectors as well. But, but in a project that I, I'm working on with folks at the Census Bureau, but also at the University of Michigan, we're tapping into this kind of data from a variety of different sources, both from internet retailers, brick and mortar firms, from aggregators, I'm going to tell you very briefly about what we've gotten out of an aggregator. By aggregator, I mean somebody like Nielsen or the NPD product group. And, and the thing about this data is, is they're, they're sitting on top of, at the item level, literally you know, some particular item of, 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 of goods, they're sitting on top of both the, both the price of those items, the quantities of those items, and the product characteristics. And it's particularly the latter that turns out also to be uh, very important because that means that not only can you put together these statistics in an integrated, consistent uh, manner, but you can actually do quality change at scale. Because if you need have the basically you have the product characteristics for the full set of goods, you, you have the opportunity, for example, to do a Donix at scale. It's important to note, for example, the CPI only has about seven percent of its products 
that uh, that have quality adjustment uh, with hedonics. They, the BLS tries to do other things, but I think it's pretty clear, and I'll give you some evidence of this in just a second, that those methods are imperfect. So in principle, if we could figure out a way to harvest this fire hose of data, and various people have ideas about how to do that, we could produce, I'd say, better data, truly real-time kind of data, um, more granular than our high-frequency data uh, are. And, and we could even go after, because we had so much granularity, we could go after um, distributional kind of statistics as well. So just to give you one example from this project, I won't go through the details of this, but this is a, a reasonably mundane consumer product, but, but, it, but and this is, this is uh, based upon price quantity and attribute data from, a, uh, from the NPD product group, but, it, but it's, a, it's actually a pretty interesting uh, product coffee makers. It turns out over this particular sample period, that we, we had this data um, where we had literally the universal coverage of all the PQ and attributes of, uh, sold in the United States um, is this was, this was during a period of time when there was this big, big shift to, to single serve uh, uh, pod maker. So what, I, again, won't go through the details here, but, but you can see here the Las Pears index is essentially what the CPI is doing. And, and um, you can see even, even without doing any more quality adjustment, just having, I'll say the real-time weights that, that allow you to do, do a Tornquist or a Fisher, you get, a, you get quite a big change for this relatively mundane uh, uh, product. And then on top of that, because you have the attributes data, and I won't go through the detailed methods, whatever, you get another uh, non-trivial kick. By the way, we, I should note in, in other more high-tech products, we find even a bigger kick from the quality adjustment as you would expect. But, but one thing that we've been struck by as we've done this, by the way, we've done this across all kinds of different goods is literally every product group, it looks as though we're overstating uh, the rate of inflation because we're not taking into account both the changing product turnover, but also we're not picking up, and, and I think this has come up earlier today, we're not picking up the, the amazing increase in variety that goes on. And indeed that, 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 that's a source uh, of quality improvement as well. So, I've already kind of made these points, and I want to, and I want to kind of bring this uh, uh, to a close. I mean, if we could if we could pull off this reengineering, um, you know, the, 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 lots of things would, would would be possible. One is, I think we we'd have a real shot at at, um, at capturing quality change at scale. Would we get at all the kinds of things I heard about today? The answer is no, not immediately, but at least we kind of get the core right. And I think again. I think the evidence is so far from this kind of work is that we're, we're overstating inflation, both from the substitution bias. That's an old point, but it turns out now with these item level data that we can, we can really get a, our arms around uh, how big that bias is. And second, we can do quality adjustment uh, at scale. I mean, I, and and I, I think it's important to note that there have been many episodes where, uh, you know, one way to think about this is, it's particularly the high frequency statistics were in trouble. And, and one way to view it is you could say, eventually we get things right in the current system. But, but, but if, you, if those of you who know kind of the nuts and bolts of the system, really when we get things right is every five years in economic censuses. And so then between economic censuses, you know, five-year period is a long period of time. Obviously, the last 18 months have, have shown us that that's a very long period of time. That the, the current estimates, both on prices side and on the quantity side, they're too smooth. They use outdated weights. There's lots of interpolation, extrapolation, and so on. And you know, what are examples where we got things really wrong? Well, it, we didn't actually realize in late 2008, even though everybody knew the economy was tanking, we did not realize how bad it was in real time. It wasn't until all the revisions came in and all the changes came in that, that we realized. And even then, by the way, we could, we could go on and say there were aspects, it's not just the level of overall economic activity that plummeted in 2008, but certain components. We learned later, for example, that young and small businesses just got hammered in the Great Recession. And that turned out to be really important for uh, 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 policy, but we didn't know that until several years later. So I'll, I'll stop here basically, but, but with the following thought. The, the agencies know about this clearly. They know about both the push and the pull factors and they're actively working on this. But, but they, you know, they, they have, a, it's like they have a day job, right? Their day job is to produce the current statistics and they are, they are hard pressed to be able to produce the current statistics and then also try to deal with some of the issues that have come up today. So, yeah, I, 
on the one hand, I think what I've talked about is, is actually feasible literally right now, but it will require a major investment in data infrastructure to pull this off. I mean, literally it will require both the resources to pull this off and also it will require uh, some, some consideration of changing the architecture, not only of the data, but the agencies themselves. I'll stop there. Well, well, that has been fantastic, John. I mean, and you've you've really made the point that I wanted to end this conference with is not only are there problems, but there's things that we can do about this at this point. So I'm going to ask a weird question. Right? I mean, um, Robert talked about, you know, don't waste a good crisis. What would the sort of crisis look like that would force, if you look back at the history of GDP, we didn't put the money into GDP out of, in, randomly. We put it in because of basically because of World War II and a little bit because of the depression, but mostly because of World War II. What sort of crisis would we be able to avoid with this sort of investment that would st stimulate Congress to be willing to sort of ante up the money? Because I'm thinking about this in a, in a practical terms at this point, what can we, how can we make this argument? Because you're very convincing. So. So, so we're, we're, you know, we can make lots of arguments out of the Great Recession about all the things we missed. I think I could, I could go on. I gave you kind of one piece of it. it what's a little harder to do, but, but I, but I think we'd like to kind of get there. Is I, I think there's a, there's a good case we're mismeasuring things terribly in during the pandemic. I actually think we're we really don't know what the rate of inflation is. Inflation is getting an enormous amount of attention. The the market basket of goods has changed dramatically. In, in the pandemic and, 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 and our current system is just not picking that, picking that up. Uh, and so it, exactly which direction those biases go is pretty complicated actually. So I, so I don't wanna say I know for a fact that we're, w w which direction we're overstating or understating, but, 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 but am I convinced that we're, we're misstating the rate of in, in inflation? Yeah, there, by the way, there are some people who, who argued, for example, I, I talked a little bit about this, the substitution bias that I talked about is, you know, has been especially imp important over this 18 months. And so that the, the fact that we're using all these Lisperre's indicators it, it, it is, it, is we are actually overstating. You know, others have, I've been talking, for example, to Todd Johnson at NPD, who's the CEO of NPD about all this, because we're working with this data. He's actually very interested in the idea that the mix of products that, that consumers are buying are actually uh, constrained by some of the supply constraints that both uh, Robert and, and Sue were talking about. And, and so if it's, if it's being driven by supply constraints, then that's what the, the, the product mix is changing because of those reasons, that, that, that pushes in the other direction. I mean, that's, 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 that, that's true increases in prices that, that, are, that, that, that are inflationary, inflationary associated with the supply chain. So, so anyway, I, I think we're probably, I think we're probably missing things badly on, on the inflation um, up front. And I think the other thing that I think we, we've, we're, we're struggling with greatly is, is, is and, and I, this is related to the, the first set of remarks from Diane and, and, and Shane, is do we really believe the productivity statistics over the last decade or, or, more, <laughs> or more? So Because if you take them seriously, we're, you know, we've we're, we're, we're we've been in a period. Who knows what's going on in the pandemic? That's a whole a whole other ballgame. But we're in a period of just a, just anemic productivity growth. And so the technological, you know, and so that's where people like Shane and Diane kind of say, well, there's all these zero price goods, and Eric Rubin Dolson saying, you know, all these kinds of AIs kicking it in these various ways, and, and and the numbers are just behind. And so, I mean, I think that makes I think that makes policy incredibly difficult. Uh, on on for both monetary fiscal policy and and, and and even distributional policy. So, so I mean, it is true. So, so Michael, you, great great question is how can we how can we make you know come up with I'll call it the the ten examples that that just make the case overwhelming because it's you know the, the set of people who are who are still here or who are here all day in some sense we're we, we truly are preaching to the choir right this and is, there are more there, we we are live streaming incidentally so there's many more people than you see okay okay but 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 in any event uh uh yeah lots of the folks here are probably say yeah 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 this makes sense and so you you're exactly right it is part of this is is to kind of come up with 
the, the I'll say, and, and tends to not a magic number, but a small number of, of, of examples that say, look, we, 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 we need a major investment in the statistical infrastructure. You know, we, we just passed, a, you know, a trillions of dollars for infrastructure. And one key piece of infrastructure for the economy is the data infrastructure. And so we, we need to make that case. Okay, I think that's a really good note to end this conference on. Thank you so much, John, for your for your for your time, and thank all the other panelists for 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 their time as well. Because this is this is uh, well, actually, let's see. Um, uh, right, let's, let's see. We have one more question. Okay, and let's not let's 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 take that. If, if this is once again, it's from Andrew Reamer. If the improvements you propose were implemented, to what we to what extent would be would be improving existing indicators and to what to what extent would we we be creating new ones i think we the, the core of what i'm talking about is is improving existing ones but i think then if 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 we are as nimble as we can get with these transactions level data or are sort of harvesting the data i think then we have an ability to produce new statistics and potentially address some of the issues that we that were talked about earlier today. I mean, so the question is, to, to what extent, and this, this is a good question for all my, the, the previous panelists as well, is, 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 is harvesting the transactions level data, not just in the retail trade sector, but just in, I'll say in general, all the digitized data that's out there, how can that fill in the data gaps that we heard about earlier today? I think that's, that's, a, that's a great question to end on. And thank you, thanks to you, thanks to all the other participants. And this is, we, we intend to continue on this. We were going to, we are going to um, put this uh, conference online. We're going to put out a, um, a summary paper of the policy implications and we intend to uh, follow up on this because as part of the Innovation Frontier Project, innovation in statistics is, is one of our key, key focus areas. Thank you very much and, and you have a great day. And thank you to everybody who, is, who, who came in and out over this very long, uh, a very long conference and, and feel free to sort of get in touch with us if you're uh, interested in getting a copy of the paper. Thank you very much. Have a great day.